Hi, welcome to the Modern Divorce Podcast. This is Billy Tarasio, and today I am here with my good friend, Brian Reedy, who is also a family law attorney, but he is in outside of Chicago. Brian, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks, Billy. Uh, Brian Reedy with Reedy Law Office. We help people through divorce with dignity. Um, so I, I'm just uh, glad to catch up with you, and uh, I guess we could talk some shop for uh, to help some people. So that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we are going to get to your contact information and everything so that if people are in Chicago and they want to contact you, they can. But today's topic is one that I've wanted to talk about for a while. And it is the difference between community property and separate property. And this is one of those subjects that people, I think, are really curious about. And what's the difference and why does it matter? And so before we dive into what is separate property, um, I'm just going to recap for all of our Arizona listeners, what is a community property state? And a community property state, it means that when the community um, begins, when p- two people get married, a new third entity is exists. And now everything you do, you do on behalf of both people. So in the attorney world, you're jointly and several, severably liable. Like you're both, you are stuck you are bound by the acts of your of your spouse, um, whether you want to be or not. And that is during the marriage and then divorce. So Brian, what does it mean to be in a separate property state? So what what what's what's crazy is um, you know, we had we had texted before about just some of the things we're talking about. And I kind of had to go back and give myself a refresher. So I did what probably most of our clients do. And I went to the internet, right? And I Google searched, um, what is community property states? And, and there's a handful of states listed and Arizona is obviously one of them. And I had recalled talking with a, a friend of mine who's in a California divorce attorney. What they explained to me is community property. I'm like, that's very similar to what we have. And I realized Illinois is, you could say it's common law property, separate property. It's, it's, an equitable distribution state. So, and this is where it's kind of interesting because then, then as I started reading it, I was like, I'm not even sure that it is so different than Arizona um, based on, of course, the internet law is not always, you know, the 100% fact, but like in Illinois, it's kind of like a hybrid, you know, because anything acquired during the marriage is marital property. We don't call it community property, we call it marital. So the common examples that I found was like, title matters in some separate property states. So some states, if, if you kept your car separate and in your name only, that's your separate property. If you kept the bank account separate, that's your separate property, even if it's acquired during the marriage. Illinois, it's slightly a hybrid thing. We say it's marital property. It has like community property aspects, but it's divided equitably, not necessarily equally. Like, whereas I believe, and this is where I defer to you, is community property always 50-50? No. So the courts have to make an equitable distribution upon divorce and equitable yeah. is equal unless there are circumstances that make equal, not equitable. <laughs> now that is a great, that you should have that as a plaque in your, your office. So it is a starting point is 50, 50 by law. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. And that's the thing that I think that's the small nuance that maybe people, the legislatures in Illinois decided we don't want to be a community property state because for whatever reason, they don't want to be, but it's equitable distribution. And when I talk to my clients, I always say, look, the starting point's probably going to be 50-50, but then we have to look at all these different factors and, and you know divide based upon the circumstances, which sounds very much like a, equi- you know, a community property state, you know? Um, 50-50 is a very common split in Illinois. It's very common amongst many places, but obviously every circumstance is unique. So that's really, really interesting. And I don't understand why the semantics get in the way, but they do. I think the big difference is not so much upon divorce, but with respect to creditors and with respect to inheritance. So Mm -hmm. in a separate property state, if I go out and I rack up a bunch of debt and I don't pay it. Can my spouse be sued? Depends, right? On on how it's titled, right? In that sense, your title matters. So if it is um, the the individual's debt, 
um, but they're married, like they acquired during the marriage, um, the debtor, the person that owe, that they owe the money to can only sue the one spouse. But in if you get divorced, the spouse could be ordered to pay for some of the debt. So in other words, like, you know, even though it's titled in his name only, I'm just saying it's the husband here, the wife could be ordered to pay some of the debt in the divorce, but the creditor can't come after the wife. Even if the divorce says wife has to pay it, the creditor can't now sue the wife if the husband fails to pay because he wasn't, the, the wife was never a party to their, their transaction. Right. So, and, th- and to me, that makes a lot of sense. The community sure. property laws really do allow each spouse to bind the other. And, and it's one thing in divorce court to go say, okay, you were married. Now you, you have an equitable um, responsibility to pay back this debt. It's another thing to say that the debtor the, or the creditor, the, the credit card company or whomever you owe can sue both of you when you had nothing to do with it. Because in divorce court, it, since it's equitable, we can go argue our case for why a particular division wouldn't be fair. And of course, you can't argue to a creditor that it's unfair that you have to pay this debt that you knew nothing about. So in, in, a, in a community property state, both spouses can be liable? Yes. Wow. Yes. And so the creditor has, they have the right to sue both parties. Right. And the other thing that that means is I think where it gets... Um, where it comes up a lot is with regards to real property. And when we say real property, we mean houses. So sure. typically when, when you owned a house before you were married, it is your separate property. And if you were to eventually get divorced, your it would remain the separate property of the person who owned it before marriage. Now there may be a community lien Um, In Arizona, that's how we do it. There might be a community lien if the community invested in in this separate property. But the the rule essentially is if you came into it, you know, when you were before you were married and you owned it before you're married, it remains yours after marriage. Is that Mm -hmm. the same? Yeah, exactly the same thing that that the marital state could be entitled to some reimbursement. You know, they could say, hey, we, we paid down the, the mortgage and all that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of factors that go into that. But yes, exact same sort of thing that uh, title property remains separate property or non-marital property so long as it stays that way. Right. If you change the title of it, it, it now becomes marital property uh, with we actually have exceptions for estate planning purposes. Mm-hmm. So now you can actually say. I'm putting it in both of our names solely for estate planning purposes. I'm mm-hmm. not meaning to change this from non-marital to marital. So that way you're saying, if I die and I'm happily married, you can have it. But if we get divorced, it's still mine. Well, that so. seems like a good rule. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> so, so, but what, what is, gets a little tricky is when that spouse sells the house and they decide they want to get a bigger house, right? The couple now wants to get a bigger house. And um, at this point in Arizona, you cannot acquire property as your sole and separate property unless your spouse signs a disclaimer deed giving you the property. You are not allowed to acquire property in Arizona that is yours without your spouse's consent and signature. Now, does that go for all property? Like if you had an investment property, uh, same sort of thing? Yes. So let's, yeah. Yeah, let's say that um, I own a house. It's worth two hundred thousand dollars. I get married. I I want a house on the beach instead, you know, or I bought it within my inheritance, right? I bought an inheritance house, and now I want to sell it and buy a new house. Um, I can't do it without adding my spouse to the title, unless that spouse signs a disclaimer deed. Now that's not true in a separate property state, right? Yes, that, you're right. It's not true. Um, so you you can uh, have sep- you know not we call it non-marital separate um, either way, but like we call it non-marital. But for the purpose of this, for the listeners, if I call it separate, that's what I mean. But um, you can have your your separate property. You can sell it, and, it, and as long as you have like a clear paper trail, right, saying like I sold this for for five hundred thousand dollars. I then bought a different property for five hundred thousand dollars. The title has remained the same. All of that sort of stuff. You can say that's non-marital property. So you got to show that paper trail. That's the thing that that often muddies it up because people don't. 
smart people, most people don't plan their divorce when they're married, right? You don't, uh, you don't do these things out. You know, I, I am a divorce lawyer myself and I don't practice those things. So, you know, I, I think that it's silly to th expect clients to do all that, but as best you can, if you have separate property, keep it separate. If you ever wanted to go down this road. It is sad. It is sad. I was speaking to a, um, a client yesterday who received $500,000 as, as an inheritance. And he said, and you do what any married person would do. You put it in your joint account. And of course mm -hmm. now it's all gone. And, and it got me thinking like he, he's, 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 he's not wrong. Most people would simply take their inheritance and put it in their joint account. You trust your, your spouse and you're making that call. Now, what happens in Illinois when that money gets commingled, you get an inheritance and you put it in the joint account. What happens? Yeah. So it's a great question. What I, what I try to tell people is uh, the best analogy I can come up with is if you think about a pack of the Kool-Aid and then a bottle of water, right? Like your, your, your Kool-Aid is your, your separate property, right? Like you, you have it, once you pour it in, it's not gone hundred percent, but if you shake it around a little bit, it's going to be gone. And, and I use that <laughs> meaning, like, if you can see the crystals still, you might have an argument that that crystal, those little flakes are mine. But once you shake it around too much, it loses its property. And now it's, it's all in one. And, and the same kind of thing applies. So if you had that 500,000, you put it in the joint account. If, if you don't touch the account, it's, it's easy to follow. Right. But then let's say you, you took $200,000 out to go do something. Then you got some money back, you put it back in. Well, now you start getting a little muddy. Did you take 200,000 from the inheritance or was that from the premarital savings? You know, unless you got a real clear understanding what that is, you know, you're, you're probably going to start messing it up and it, and it starts, it co-mingles and it becomes marital property. So at that point, if, if you go in front of a judge and you're arguing for an equitable distribution, does the spouse that got the $500,000 in inheritance get any of it back? So depending upon obviously the facts, right? Of like, what else, what else is out there? Earning capacity, length of marriage, et cetera. So you could certainly make an equitable argument of like, hey, but for this person inheriting this money, they, would, like, they wouldn't have had whatever's in there, right? Mm -hmm. But we're also a no fault divorce state, meaning like within the last few years, um, we've had like a whole revision of our entire divorce laws, right? Like we've, we've changed child support, we've changed maintenance, we've changed the grounds. So you used to be able to, you used to have to state grounds for divorce and you had to say, hey, you know, irreconcilable difference is one of them. But like, if you couldn't get the other side, to, you'd have to say mental cruelty, you'd have to prove adultery, oh. you'd have to prove all those things, right? Um, you also had to have a two year waiting period. Oh my right? gosh. So you, couldn't, you couldn't get divorced, uh, for two years after you filed your petition unless both parties waived. And then there was a six month rule and it was just a really, they made it hard because it was written a long time ago when people were trying to essentially force bad marriages to stay together, <laughs> um, for, for God knows what reasons, but, um, you know, yeah, ultimately it's like you can we're a no fault state. So we don't get into like, Hey, did somebody have an affair? And I always say when people come in, cause oftentimes we get clients that are hurt and they say, well, they're the one who cheated and they deserve this. I'm like, but hear, hear me out here. I'm like, you can't start getting into that because you got to write laws for everybody. And I'm like, what do you do when someone has an affair? Do you give them, you give them 10% more? Now, does it matter if it's a one-time thing or what if it's an ongoing relationship? What if it was your best friend? What if it was your sibling? Like, do you get more points? Like you see where it's like, it's just a slippery slope and it's nasty. It's ugly. And it's like, we can't get into this. Our courts are already crowded. Well, we yeah, like, go down those. What if the husband was like impotent? Then, then are you allowed to cheat? Like, what if he was right. abusive? Then is it okay? Like, what, yeah. if, what if she didn't have any access to money? So she couldn't file for divorce because she was chained in a room. It's too hard. Yeah. Fine. Are you guys a no fault state as well? Oh, yeah, or? we are. Okay. Now Lila's making a lot of noise, so I'm gonna make her go out. So just a minute. All right. I I can't even hear her on this end, but now for those of you who can't see, Lila is the office dog who usually sits quietly, but of course, when we get on on video and audio decides she's going to make some noise. So thank you for that interruption. So 
y'all are no no fault. We're no fault. Um, so you can make an equitable argument to get the Kool-Aid back, even when it's all mixed up. Yep. And at that point, you're no longer arguing it's non-marital. You're just saying it's fair, more more fair, if you will, <laughs> you know, uh, the, that I get more money based upon the circumstances. And okay. You could say what I brought, you know, to the marriage, but then you start getting into, well, you know, if we're going, uh, you know, just, just the marriage, say you, you got the, the wife was earning the, the majority of the income and the husband was a stay at home person. Well then, you know, the wife in that situation could say, well, I, I brought most of the income home. Therefore I should get more of the money. The courts don't go down that road when we don't get into that because it's like, that was a marital choice you guys made, right? Meaning you guys decided wife was going to earn the income. Husband was going to do this. And, and you often get people say, well, I didn't, I didn't agree that he stood, stayed at home and played video games. I wanted him to get a job. Well, the fact that you stayed with him for another five years showed you agreed with that because you allowed this to happen. You know, like if you didn't agree and you didn't want it, you could have left sooner. And, and that's kind of a slippery slope. You know, you don't want to start getting in too much of those things, but ultimately that's, you got to draw the line somewhere and you can't say, well, you earn more money, therefore you get more money, right? So you kind of get into that counter argument of, well, yeah, you brought it in, but so what? So. Okay. So in Arizona or in community property states, whatever income is earned is community income. Whatever income is earned or not earned is community income. No ifs, ands, or buts, unless you have a prenup. In a separate property state, if you get married and you have some sort of an arrangement, you both contribute, you know, a certain amount of money into your joint account for your joint expenses and everything else is kept separate. Can you then argue that that was the intention, that was what you practiced and that's what you what you what should happen during divorce? Yeah, you could probably make that argument. I always call those situations like a joint venture. I'm like, look, you guys are treating it more like a business relationship as opposed to a marriage, but that's a different, you know, maybe a different uh, uh, thing, but um, in Illinois, that's where I realized as we are, started talking and preparing for this, is like we're, we're kind of a hybrid. You know, we, we call it an equitable distribution state. But in that scenario, in Illinois, that would be marital property, community property, regardless of, of whose name it's under. In, in the, the brief, you know, again, a uh, disclaimer, Google search, uh, in your scenario, that would be considered separate property under certain state laws. I, I don't want to even say the states because I don't want to even pretend like I'm giving advice in those states. But yeah, if it's completely separated, you could make that argument. We were separate property, separate bank accounts, separate incomes. We This money and this money only should be divided. Everything else should be separate. Now, what about businesses? Are businesses treated exactly the same way? Can yeah, you, so, you go ahead. Yeah, like anything, I, I always say that, uh, you know, I do the same thing probably you've done hundreds of times with your clients. I say anything acquired in the marriage belongs to the marriage with the exception of gifts and inheritance. And then there's some permutations off of those. Like if you had separate property and then we talked about it earlier, you buy separate property and you keep going, that could be considered separate. And I've had clients will say, okay, that's, I get that. But what about this? And I'm like, was it acquired during the marriage? Yes. Do any of the exceptions apply? No. So what's the answer? And they're like, you know, it's funny because some clients will then eventually say like, oh, I get it. It's, it's marital property. Mm -hmm. So that's where we start at. So businesses, if you start a business during the marriage, it's presumed to be marital property. Mm -hmm. um, you can make an argument depending upon where those funds came from, right? If you got, maybe you got a loan from a parent in your name only, it wasn't for the marriage. You could maybe make the argument that that was a non-marital loan and therefore it's a non-marital business, probably a shaky mm -hmm. argument, but mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that could, could come out. Mm -hmm. So be, it'd be better if it was a gift, right? Not a loan. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If it was a gift, exactly. Depending upon who, who gave the money or what they want or don't want. So in Arizona, um, if we're dividing property and the property was acquired in a non-community property state, we call it quasi-community property and divide it mm -hmm. equally anyway. Ha! Ah, to get to the end, end result the same, right? Yes. But you kind of so like make somebody feel nice, you know? We recognize that when you acquired this property, it was separate property in whatever state you were in. But now that you're here and getting divorced here, you get to split it. So is that is that the same that uh, in Illinois, it doesn't really matter what state you're in when you acquire the property, it's all gonna be equitably divided. 
And if it was acquired yeah. during the marriage, it's marital. Right. You're getting divided here or you're getting divorced here. Right. So you're submitting to the jurisdiction here, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, that's an interesting thing where, where I could see, you know, a community property attorney at some point, some be like, Hey, if you had family in a different state, maybe you might want to not get divorced here um, depending upon the circumstances. But, you know, a lot of times that's very difficult because people have roots, right? They're like, yeah, all that being nice, but my kids are here. My job is here. My, you know, community's here. Like moving sucks. You know, nobody likes to move. So nobody likes to move. Nobody likes to move at all. Um, All right. So what happens if someone owns a separate property business, they bring it into the marriage and then it grows during the marriage? Then they get divorced. Yeah, so that would be non-marital property. You know, assuming that we keep title separately, right? And assuming that uh, we, we run it separately. But there could be a, um, an argument that the marital estate is entitled to some contribution, um, especially if, you know, the, the spouse comes and works in the business, things like that. You know, um, a lot of it would be fact specific, you know, how much you're going after because, you know, are we talking a $50,000 business or a $50 million business? Obviously, the more more zeros there are, the more you're going to want to argue that you're entitled to some contribution. Um, you know, because, but for the marriage, would it have grown so much? Who knows? So that'd be a good uh, fun case to have, you know? Yeah. It, it, yes. It's, it's one of my favorite fact patterns here in Arizona. I absolutely love this fact pattern. Um, it's fun, uh, but in Arizona, the way that it works is if community effort was expended to help the property grow, then the community has a portion of the growth. If the business grew due to other um, outside influences, you know, does it, the real the estate effort count of the business owner themselves. Yes. So that, okay. So the efforts done during the, so the business owner in Arizona is really trying to minimize what they did. They're trying to. Right. They're like, uh, no demand went up and the, and yeah. the, and the building really appreciated in value. Yeah. I didn't really do anything. My, my spouse did it or, or my team did it all. I just happened to be the one that owned it. Um, you know, so right. that, that's interesting. Yes. So, but in, in Illinois where the, the individuals are not, um, it's not like everything you do is on behalf of the community. Would your efforts automatically create a marital interest? I would say like, you know, again, it's probably going to come down to like the size of the business of, of how much you're going to argue on that, right? Because, you know, if you're looking at a sizable business and, and, and also, you know, when it comes to businesses and, and a divorce, I think you're, you're really well aware. If, if it's a business that's dependent solely upon the business owner, those are harder to sell on the, the market. You're often looking for a fair market value to determine the value of the business to therefore say, my client should get this much equity of this business. So you really got to like sometimes pump the brakes and try to get the information to get like, what is this thing worth before we start going down this hole of like arguing over it before you get into there. But yeah, same kind of thing would apply. You could argue for marital contribution to the business, you know, saying like, look, you spent all your time building this thing up and yes we we agree that it start you you happen to start it a month before we got married right and okay yeah it's not marital but um if you find yourself in that situation and you're the the spouse that's not in it get yourself on the title in illinois and that should should help you out um you know do it do it while things are good don't don't wait until you come to see me because it's probably not going to be great at that point final hypothetical for you before we wrap it up Um, I was talking to someone yesterday. She got married in September. Their marriage is over. It's less than two months later. In June, she bought a house, put $150,000 of separate money in it, and put him on the title. In Arizona, before the marriage. marriage. Now, in Arizona, I, I don't have good news for her. Like, he is half a owner of this house. And unless we can convince him that there's another way that he should walk away and, and uh, yeah, she's like S O L. I do not have good news for her. Tell me, do you have better news for her in Illinois? 
yes, come come live where your governors go to jail and, and you would have been a lot happier. I mean, we put our governors go to jail a lot here, but you would not be you would not lose half your property like that on this one. So in the, in this scenario, yeah, you're married. It's your property before the marriage. Um, in fact, they actually re, they changed the law um, and actually codified it because it used to be where people could make an argument that we bought the house in contemplation of marriage and then therefore we executed on the marriage and therefore that was a contractual thing that happened. They basically said, nope, that doesn't exist because we're not going to spend hours and hours and days and days of litigation arguing over whether or not when you bought it in June and they got married in September, was that in contemplation of the marriage or does it just happen to be that you got married afterwards? Like, is it a year, two years, three months, three days? What's in contemplation of marriage? Again, you could make equitable arguments. You can say, okay, fine, it wasn't in contemplation of marriage, but we pooled our resources together or... I didn't, she didn't pay any rent and because she was saving the money for the house. Like you could make that argument. It's, it's not really going to go anywhere in Illinois. She would have been better off, but then you have to deal with the winters here. So tell her that she's got good news, bad news. So you she don't could, have to deal with Chicago winters, Yeah, but you lost half your property. Right. So I, don't know. So, I, so I just want to make sure I understand in Illinois, she goes to get a divorce. Now she gets her house back. Mm-hmm. How? How do we prove? It's hers. But she put his name on the title. Before, well, you know, the, the way I look at it is like, did she do it? Like, if she did it with the, the thought of I'm giving this to the marriage, then it's marital, right? But if she did it with the, I'm doing it for the estate planning purposes, which is what I would have told her, right? You did it because now you're married and you wouldn't want your, your widowed husband to, to have to go through all this stuff, right? And she would say, that's exactly why yes. I did it. That's exactly why I did it. And I was right. like, so based upon that, I know you guys probably didn't formalize that, but I know that's why you did it because you're a smart estate planning person. You're thinking ahead. You just got married. You started thinking about, hey, all this sort of stuff. You're, you're thinking ahead. Um, in that scenario, she would get it all back. If she said, nope, I thought things were going to be great. Mm -hmm. I thought I can trust this person with everything. Mm -hmm. And I decided to give our, my house that I bought to the marriage as a mm -hmm. gift. Well, now it belongs to the marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's an intent question. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, that, that's a little bit more favorable than your SOL. So yes, you're right. She gets, she gets lovely winters, but she may lose her house. We'll see. We'll see what we can negotiate for her because you know what? There's what the law says, and then there's what you're able to negotiate. And so we can never I underestimate agree. the power of a good attorney and the power of persuasion. It, you're, you're hundred percent correct. As much as I like to laugh and, and have, you know, make little jokes, there, there's nothing to be said about like having a good attorney on your side, because too many people will go on the internet and do what I did. And they'll just be like, well, it's 50%. I guess I'm shit out of luck. And they just pack it in. I'm sorry for swearing on your podcast. I don't know if that's not acceptable. Uh, I think you should have a mute, you should have a mute button for me. If coming it's not, on, someone will beep it out. I don't <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, the, you know, the, the, the reality is like, if you just want to type in your, your information in the internet and take what comes out, then that's what you're going to get, but you may end up losing half your house when you might not have lost it all, you know, for, by having a good negotiator. And, and the thing about it is, is people that try to negotiate on, on their own behalf, I'm always like, there's a reason world-class surgeons don't operate on themselves or, or their own kids, right? It's like, could they do it? Yeah, but they don't operate on their own kids because there's a lot more at stake, right? Like the, the risks are higher. They know this is their kid on the line not just, you know, somebody else. And the emo when emotions get in the way, you, you really mess up your negotiation. So having a professional like yourself, like in their corner um, and, the, and a team of professionals, more importantly, to gather that information and, and argue on their behalf, you're going to be way better off. Absolutely. So Brian, how can people reach you if they need to get a hold of you? Um, I guess the, the best thing probably would uh, go to our website, readylawoffice.com. You can call us. I am, uh, I'm, I'm an, like an aspiring person. I wish I was like really good at like Twitter, but like, hey, hit me up on Twitter. Like, I'm really not good at it. Um, call the office would be great. You know, our office number's on there. Um, you know, I'm happy to help with anything I, 
I can do. You can email info at radylawoffice.com. Um, awesome. Get back to you. I'll put, uh, I'll put all your contact information in the show notes. Thank you so much. It's been great to chat about the differences between separate marital community property. Um, and, you know, I think the the bottom line is it's not that different. No. And I, I would be interested to, if you found somebody else who, you know, we probably could put our heads together who might be in a true separate property state. Because as I started realizing, Illinois is that like hybrid equitable property state where it's it's kind of community but it's the I, my my takeaway was community property states explicitly state we start at 50 percent unless there's a reason not to in illinois we don't say 50 percent. we just say it's equitable mm -hmm. but traditionally a starting point is 50 50 mm -hmm. depending upon the circumstances but it's probably awesome. very similar there so well, this has been great and it's it's definitely got me thinking and I would love to have you on again and talk about the difference between um, proving fault versus no fault because I've never been in a state that had fault divorce. I imagine it would be a lot juicier. So we'll have to yeah, do it. I mean, well, it, well we, we used to have um, mental cruelty and the what I always told people is like, because it sounds terrible, mental cruelty. But it was like the only way you could get divorced if you had a spouse that wasn't cooperating. Like if the other spouse didn't come involved and, and didn't want to participate, you had to prove mental cruelty. And I always said, look, if you've been married for more than six months, you've endured mental cruelty. Like because you would just say, like, did your spouse say things that hurt your feelings? Did it bother you? Did it, you know, did you feel less about yourself? And like, well, if you've been married for, you know, a few months, everybody's been through that. So, you know. <laughs> so it's not all that exciting is what you're saying. <laughs> no, it's not that exciting. I mean, you could prove infidelity and stuff like that. You'd have to, you know, get a, like a, a, somebody to chase him down or get somebody to prove it. But it's like, God, it was, it, it was really not a good thing. Cause it's like this public record. I'm like, look, you're getting divorced. Like, do you need to prove that dad was a, a scumbag sleeping around? Like kids can go re read that someday. I'm like, no one really wins with that. You know? Right. So. It's a good change. Go Illinois. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Brian. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay. You got it, Billy. Bye. Thank you.